My right hand represents some discouraging piece of news. My left hand is my sadness. The sound is the dialectic. The sting is the need to push back. Consuming standard issue news is like any other form of consumption. Momentary satiety followed by mindless avoidance of all waste produced. Satiety, never clarity. Consuming news is to stay manacled on a decaying carousel in a toxic fog. It's only by pushing back do we gain clarity. Pushing back is the only way to disperse the fog, stop the carousel, and transform it to David's sling. This is the third in a series of shows called Pushback Storytelling. Start by identifying a current political or economic phenomenon and then talk with a guest doing exactly the opposite and having success. The guest is negating the status quo. It's called storytelling to emphasize the personal, the local. Most of us can't affect national or international politics or macroeconomics, but we can meet with city council members or our county commissioners or legislators, and day to day, we can vote with our dollars. Pushback storytelling aims to provide a toolkit to those watching on how they can help bend the arc of history towards justice. An autopsy in February in Norway was one of the origins for this show. A cuvier-beaked whale was discovered to have 89 pounds of plastic in its stomach. It starved to death because its body couldn't digest the contents. Apparently, some plastic debris looks like its main meal squid. It dives deeper and longer than any other animal, over 6,000 feet and two hours. As the whale starves and dehydrates, it hunts closer and closer to the surface, where there's more and more plastic to deceive our fellow man mammal. Another whale was discovered to have died the same way near the Philippines a few days ago. Now what? Is this another painful factoid designed to make you feel helpless? That's not what pushback storytelling is about. Last week, the European Union voted to ban single-use plastics like straws and bags. There are nine states with Republican-controlled government, governments which ban plastic bag bans. Convenience will kill us it's certainly getting to be the apex predator in the Atlantic and Pacific. What's to be done? Who's pushing back? Enter, enter Amber Hagedahl and Kate Marnack, the founders of Tear Market. Reading from their mission statement, at Tear Market, we want to make sustainable living convenient and accessible to all people, so as a community, we can decrease our environmental impact. How will they fulfill their mission? They explained that to me when we met in their new store. They're getting ready to open just before Earth Day on April 19th. It's a few blocks east of, 30, of the 38th Street LRT station. Welcome, Amber and Kate. I'm wondering, Kate, would you tell us a little bit about Amber? Sure. Um, Amber is a native Californian um, who moved here with her husband, who is from Minnesota. She is a conservation biologist by trade, um, has a master's in that, and she loves her chocolate lab, Toby, and she loves um, water polo, and is a huge um, just environmentalist, and it's always been a passion of hers to help the environment. And Amber, would you introduce Kate? Yeah, this is Kate Marnack. She's a mom of three. She's originally from the suburbs of um, Minneapolis, um, she has her degree in biology and a minor in business. She's always been interested in the environment. Um, she hates beets, just learned this, um, uh, but like sauerkraut. Um, and she lives right now in Maple Grove, but is looking to come back to Minneapolis. And she started a blog about going zero waste with kids um, a, few years ago, a few years ago called Zero-ish. So um, I'm always interested in, uh, so I stood in your soon to be open store, mm -hmm. but I'm always interested, how did we get, and it's got a sign up along, so people walking along the sidewalk can see it. 
Um, but I'm always interested in what was going on when you had the initial idea? Were you together? Did you look at each other and say, we should do this? What, how, did, how did it get started? Um, actually, we've only known each other for a little over a year. Um, as she mentioned, I started a blog with a couple friends of mine about zero waste with families, and she had um, her own blog called zerowasted.net, just also helping people go zero waste and make the transition and help the environment. So we kind of independently came to this you know, mission or this journey um, separately, and we met at the Green Fair, the Nokomis Green Fair, and we both had come up with the idea of starting a store, and we were kind of f trying to find Individually. people. Individually? Yeah, okay. yeah, and so we were trying to find people who would want to you know, jump in with us, and it just kind of ended up being, you know, we worked with several people early on just to kind of hash out ideas, but in the end, it was the two of us, mm -hmm. so. And were, were your ideas, were they congruent? Did they overlap? Did they fit pretty well initially, or was there some negotiation to make all the pieces come together? I think there was a lot of evolution, and that really came from the community, not so much Kate and I. So um, we have really tried to get out in the community as much as possible, and, and that's actually, I think, really why we both had this idea of starting a store, is we had heard from community members that they really wanted to shop plastic-free, or they really wanted to find certain environmental products, but they couldn't find them locally, and so people were saying, someone really needs to start a store. And so Kate and I kept hearing that over and over. Um, and so when we finally did get together and thought, okay, let's try to make this work, we really went to the community and asked them what they would want to see. Well, that I think is key from what you told me that, um, I mean, I'm thinking back to when I was a kid and everybody wanted to start a food co-op. Mm -hmm. And it was just basically people who wanted a certain kind of food and it would all happen in somebody's garage. Okay. But what impressed me is uh, the, the survey that you did. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, we put together a survey. We just, as Amber said, we wanted to know what people wanted to see. Um, obviously, it was part of figuring out if this was a viable business, you know, if, if Minneapolis wanted it. Um, we've seen this model work other places, but it's not really something that's done in the U.S. yet. So we, we really just wanted to get kind of our market research and put out those questions and help to mold the store that we thought would work and that we thought would support zero waste, but also mold it to what the community mm -hmm. wanted and would actually come to. And, and how many responses did you get in your survey? Over 500 responses to that one particular survey, which we administered in August of last year. We also were lucky enough to, to meet someone who works in the survey world, the marketing world, and they tacked a, a few questions of our survey onto a, a larger survey that went out to about 1,000 people. So we really got some great feedback from people about not only what they would like to see, but basic information that any business owner needs, like mm -hmm. you know, how often does someone grocery shop, who's responsible, what's important to them, is it organic produce or local mm -hmm. or package-free, so that we could really gear um, tear market to what the community really wanted and needed. Right. Uh, now, you mentioned something about other stores elsewhere mm -hmm. um, providing somewhat of a model. Is there a particular store uh, that you felt had a lot of good ideas that, you, that was a good guide? Um, there is one, one of the very first ones, I believe it's in the UK, it's called Earth Food Love. Um, that's, that was a big inspiration for me early on. Um, they are a smaller, you know, efficient style, walkable store in a town, not even in a big city. It's not, you know, in London. I think it's in a smaller town in the UK. Um, but, you know, they offer the shelf-stable bulk foods along with all, all, you know, many of the other products package-free or in compostable packaging. And we really liked the idea of it being a smaller, efficient store. We're not opening a giant, you know, grocery store. Um, we want it to be a neighborhood store, mm -hmm. but also a store that supports zero waste. So these very similar stores have popped up all over Europe now. It's just, it's exploded in the past, I would say, three years. Now, you said the magic word, walkable. Mm -hmm. So share a little bit about uh, how you decided to locate where you're located. Well, Amber found it, so I'll let you know. <laughs> Found it on Craigslist. <laughs> Um, yeah, it was really important to us to find a storefront that um, was near at least one form of public transportation, so either a bus or the train, um, and was also bikeable, and then was in a neighborhood where there were residents that 
were interested in sustainable living, definitely, but that the population was really diverse, raci racially, socioeconomically, religiously, mm -hmm. um, and that people could walk there and that there were other businesses in the area so that we could create kind of this walkable neighborhood. Um, we also wanted to put it in a space where there wasn't already a grocery store. So the area where Terra Market is located is considered a food desert because there's no access to food in that neighborhood. People have to get in their cars and they have to Except drive. Except the barbecue. Except <laughs> that there's yeah, a barbecue restaurant. place, Northbound Breweries right across the street. We've got some great local businesses, a cupcake place, but no place to get right. groceries. Right. Right. Um, and so when we found our space um, at 2717 East 38th Street, that's our address. It's on two major bus routes. It's a block from the light rail station. It has parking, so if you do drive, then, then there's parking for you. It's very walkable. There's lots of neighborhood businesses around, mm -hmm. um, and it's got bike racks, so you can bike there as well. And we've got the, the bike lanes on uh, along Minnehaha mm -hmm. next to the LRT. Mm -hmm. um, so we've heard all kinds of things floating around here, bulk, and this and that and this. Walk, walk me through the store. What am I going to see when I open up the door and I come in? What kinds of things am I going to see? What's going to be offered? Uh, we have a lot of you know, general health beauty home products, everything from bamboo toothbrushes to uh, deodorant in a compostable tube, um, hank reusable handkerchiefs, stuff like that. These are items that we searched and searched locally to find without having to order, and we found ourselves constantly ordering them online, you know, to find a plastic-free version of these everyday mm -hmm. items. You know, a dish brush, for example. I, I remember I started using plastic dish brushes, and at some point, well before Zero Waste, I sat there and looked at it and going, oh my God, I'm throwing this whole thing away, and I couldn't find an alternative. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the first section when you walk in will be a lot of those items. And then we'll have a large bulk shelf stable, um, so basically dry goods and snacks, flour, sugars, a uh, bulk section where you can bring your own container, you weigh it, you fill it with as much or as little as you want, and then you just pay for what's inside. Um, we'll have a small um, amount that's refrigerated. We'll have nut grinders to grind your own nut butters that again you can put in your own jar, um, spices, teas. But then we also will have a grab and go section with a with jars that are all you know, tear market jars that you put a deposit on and you can bring it home, you know, come in, just mm -hmm. grab the pre-filled jar, pay a deposit, you bring it back, you get your deposit back and we clean them and reuse them. And can I also just buy containers? Yeah. From, so that uh, long term, mm -hmm. I'm not uh, purchasing one use. Yep. So uh, that, that's, that's a possibility too. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, this all sounds good, um, but uh, tell me what's the difference between your offering and I think the closest co-op to you is Seward. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between what you're offering and what I can get and do at Seward? Mm -hmm. I like to think of our bulk section, which is about 100 um, shelf staple goods, is like their section on steroids. Um, because a lot of people love Seward, and we love Seward. I shop there a lot. They offer some fantastic things for the mm -hmm. community. Um, but what we've heard from people is that they don't offer like hard to find items that people use every day, like baking soda, plastic free, for example. Um, a lot of cooking supplies, DIY supplies, liquid cleaners like dishwashing detergent or laundry soap. They don't have plastic free or in bulk. And so we're going to offer some of those items that the co-ops can't offer. Um, and that's, I think, really what distinguishes us. And we're also, because we're small and we really are um, trying to be what the community wants, if someone comes into our space and says, hey, I really need A, B, or C to be zero waste, can you help me? We're either going to do our best to help them find mm -hmm. that vendor locally or we're going to do our best to bring it into the store. So we're very mobile. And, and what we can carry as well. And I, th I also like to think that we have done the vetting and the work for the customer. Um, I know when I started going zero waste, I really wanted one place that I could walk into and find an option for all of these items, plastic free mm -hmm. or, or without packaging or in less packaging. So, I, and I was getting sick of having to go to five different stores and then still not finding it. So mm -hmm. I think we've done the work of finding the best or one of the best options out there. So when you walk into our store and you are wanting to make 
an environmental impact, you know that what you buy with us is just about as you know friendly as it gets to the environment. As and of now. that's one of the critical services that I look to a co-op for mm -hmm. is they do the vetting, um, or I also like the term curate mm -hmm. in the sense of uh, uh, knowing history. Mm -hmm. um, but it is imposing now with the internet of how many hours it can take to research something yes. thoroughly. Mm -hmm. So now I can walk through a door and be confident that you've done all that hard work mm -hmm. and that's part of the value added. Mm -hmm. That your research is making selections so that when I walk in rather than having this many possibilities, you've brought it down to this many possibilities. Mm -hmm. So the, the choice is, is much more straightforward from somebody who's a, a customer of yours. Mm -hmm. But that's, to me, an invaluable service to the community, especially in this where there's so much uh, conflicting information. Now, one of the things that intrigues me about research is um, uh, reading something on your website was this absolutely wonderful uh, number of the usage life of a plastic bag is 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. Now, that intrigues me. I want to know who put the stopwatch on it. At the turn of the 19th and 20th century, there was a guy by the name of Taylor who did all sorts of time motion studies. And he literally clocked. He was hired by companies to clock every task, break it down into pieces, and make it more efficient. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to know who put the stopwatch on 12 minutes. Because I'm sitting there thinking, well, let's see, I mindlessly accept a bag, I take it, I put it in my car, it's, and I drive for some time to get home. Minutes are ticking by. Mm -hmm. Then I pick it up and I carry it inside, and I throw it on the counter, and maybe I unload it. But it strikes me as more than 12 minutes have gone by. My whole point here is I did a fair amount of research trying to track down the origin of that number, and I find it quoted again and again and again, but I couldn't find the origin. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have any idea who the first the person who actually put the clock on it was? I don't know who put the clock on it. Where I've seen the information is at the USDA um, and the U.S. Agricultural Agency, so um, I don't know if they had the information um, to start with or um, but that is where, where we've seen it, and um, they're a pretty reputable source, so we like to think that they're, they're accurate. Um, but like you said, maybe for you, the average use of a, a plastic bag, which maybe you don't even use, but maybe you used to or what you have in your life, is, let's say, longer, so it's 20 minutes or even a half an hour. Um, I think it comes down to the, the, no matter how long you use a plastic bag, whether it's 12 minutes or half an hour, or we use it again and again and again until it's it has a hole long. in it. Once you put that in the landfill and it becomes encapsulated and it right. sits there, right. it doesn't decompose. Right. It will never decompose in our lifetime. Exactly. And so even if you do use a plastic bag and you think, oh, well, I'm reusing it, it's okay. Or you think, oh, I'm recycling it, so you put it in your recycling right. bin that actually doesn't get recycled and ends up causing all kinds of issues at the recycling center because plastic gets caught in, caught the, in, the, machinery. in the machinery. Exactly. Yep. It's too long, um, it, the, the time it yes. takes. To no, I, I agree. I'm, yeah. I'm, the 12, I'm just, uh, just mm -hmm. reminding us about the nature of research. But you're yes. absolutely right. The issue is not 12 minutes, 20 minutes, or two weeks, or a year. The issue is creating the thing in the first place that's doomed to conceivably uh, kill uh, a whale. Well, and um, I, did, I just wanted to add in, I yep. saw a really interesting video that somebody took that is, I mean, it's a snapshot from anyone's daily life, I think, that, that lives in the world we live in now. And they showed a guy going to a bakery, grabbing a croissant, putting it in a little plastic bag, walking outside, taking the croissant out and eating it, and the plastic bag went right in the trash. And yeah, of course, yeah. in the graphic, they showed, you know, yes. it missed the trash and it, yeah, it littered. Yeah. But the point is, you know, you, we use these plastic bags literally sometimes for one minute. I mean, it's, it's kind of insane. And then I even look at, you know, kids, the amount of parents that will put all of their kids' snacks in a little Ziploc baggie yeah. every time they make a lunch or every time they hand their kid a snack. How many of those baggies are you going through every day that right. maybe do only get used for or 10 minutes? Or the lifetime minutes? of the kid. Right. Yeah. It, it, you know, I think a long time ago, I remember my parents and my grandparents washing out plastic bags, mm -hmm. you know, Ziploc bags and hanging them to dry, and mm -hmm. and that's better, but I don't, I think a lot of people don't do that now. You no. know, I think a lot of people just pull them out and then they toss them. Definitely 
a minority approach. Um, Amber, one of the things I wanted to talk about was um, when we talk about, we're, we're talking about change here, change of behavior, mm -hmm. change of attitude, change of action. Um, for a lot of people, instantly it's, oh God, not something else to worry about. I understand a little bit in your family that there was a difference of pace of mm -hmm. how quickly you wanted to change. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, just so people have a feeling for how they might work through the whole mental a aspect of change, if you could just share a little bit of your story. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I, I learned about zero waste in the beginning of 2017, actually at Seward Co-op, and they had a community education class called Zero Waste Grocery Shopping. And I went to that class and thought, well, I know everything there is to know about the environment because I'm an environmentalist and I always recycle. And I came out of that class amazed and shocked at what I had heard about how every plastic toothbrush you use in your entire life sits in the landfill, not mm -hmm. decomposing, and then the average life of a plastic bag. And so I vowed, like, right then, I'm going to live my life differently from now on because not only is it going to be fairly easy, um, because I just have to change what I'm buying. Instead of buying carrots in a plastic bag, I just buy the loose carrots and put mm -hmm. them in my own reusable bag. Um, but it also was going to help me feel like I'm making a difference because I was getting really frustrated that our government wasn't doing enough to fight climate change. So here's something I could do. So I came home and just immediately vowed to never use plastic again. Well, of course, like I don't live by myself. So my husband, um, was like, what does this mean? I can't buy cereal anymore that comes with a plastic liner. I can't buy crackers anymore. I can't buy this. And he really had a hard time because he didn't go to the class. Sure. He didn't learn the facts that I learned. And he's an environmentalist. And when I started moving us towards zero waste, I did it overnight. And then for other people, I wouldn't recommend doing that. <laughs> I would recommend baby steps and taking your partner along the journey with you so that you're not just forcing them to do something because when you force someone to do something they don't want to do it and it's not going to stick and i've heard that for someone to change their behavior it takes almost a whole month like 26 27 days and if you repeat that behavior over and over and over eventually it just becomes second nature and so I, what I would recommend doing is instead of doing what I did, um, is to work with your family member, your roommate, your partner, whoever you're living with, and go through that journey together. So learn the facts together, um, whether that's watching YouTube videos about zero waste or attending a class together. We offer classes at Tear Market that people can attend. Um, and then making a plan together about how you want to move forward implementing certain steps. So mm -hmm. whether that's you want a zero waste grocery shop or you want to go plastic free or you maybe want to try um, composting for your food waste and, and, and incorporate that with the people that you're living with and you're having these relationships with so that they can feel like they're a part of it. And then soon enough, that will be regular behavior for your whole household to take mm -hmm. the compost into your backyard or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. So to really make those baby steps. And I will say my husband is fantastic and he is full on board now, <laughs> um, but he had a hard time with me coming home and just being like, no more plastic. So uh, we've, we've survived. But we've you survived. Moved. Yeah. Now, um, one of the things that strikes me, Kate, is um, so, I can only imagine how hard it is for a working mom to shop, mm -hmm. especially if she is interested in having a positive effect on the environment. And uh, I understand you have three kids. Mm -hmm. um, so what has Terra Market done with a working mom in mind to try and make shopping easier for her? Uh, yeah, I definitely don't love taking all three of my kids shopping, especially grocery shopping. It is chaotic, and, you know, I have a two-year-old that might be sticking her hands in, you know, bulk bins or whatever. So um, we took my experience, but also heard from other people, you know, moms or, or even non-parents. You know, people are busy, um, and they don't always have time maybe to come in, or they they think, oh, it's going to take me so long to fill up all my jars, you know, and whatnot, and I have five minutes to get in and get out. So we, that's where we came up with our grab and go section with the, the deposits on the jars, as you would see with uh, milk bottles um, at a lot of the co-ops. So you can just come in, grab a lot of these shelf stable items, pre-filled in a jar, you're in and out in say five to 10 minutes, you 
you know, keep your kid from destroying making, everything. Making life a little <laughs> yep. earlier, easier for mom. <laughs> yep, exactly. And a little less destructive for the, the little ones. Or dads. Moms or dads. dads. Moms yes. or dads. Yes. Um, now, uh, let's see. Uh, opening is coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When is the big day? I think we're still in business. When is, <laughs> when is the big day? April 19th is our first day open. And uh, fully open, ready to receive uh, customers and do business. Yep, that's yeah. um, Any special events planned around that uh, as far as music, classes? Yeah, we've got a big party April 19th, so people can feel free to come to that, <clears throat> excuse me, from 4 to 8. Um, that'll be a celebration. We had a crowdfunding campaign that uh, ended yesterday mm -hmm. um, that raised $18,000 for the store. So that was a huge success. Um, so we'll be celebrating the crowdfunding campaign and the opening of the store. Um, we're doing classes over the weekend. So we have a um, thrift store, secondhand how-to class facilitated by an awesome educator. That'll be in St. Paul, but you sign up through us and, and she'll, um, she'll meet near Eggplant Urban Supply in St. Paul and do that class. Um, and we've got lots of other classes on our website, so people can check out the events page of our website because we've got a handful of upcoming events that people can register for if they're interested in um, a whole bunch of different zero waste living ideas and things. Okay, uh, the address again is of the, the store? 2717 East 38th Street. And if you could say that one more time, please. 2717 East 38th Street, Minneapolis. Okay, and their, their name and logo is on a sign mm -hmm. above the sidewalk, so it's easy to see. Um, they're on the south side of 38th as, as uh, you're headed uh, west. Um, and uh, for more information, website address? www.theteramarket.com. And we are also on Instagram and Facebook at Tear Market. Well, Kate, Amber, thank you for being my guest today. Thank you thank for having you. us. You are definitely welcome. You can post comments, questions, suggest topics or guests for future shows on the Affirming Flame Facebook page. That's the Affirming Flame. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you'll check out Tear Market's website. I'm Cal Heil.